as a native man myself, I can tell you there's a bunch of native paranormal stories that you have no clue about. Most people only know about skinwalkers, but even those themselves, we've seen what the internet and ignorant people do when they take something like this and just spread it around. First of all, a skinwalker is not a creature. They're actually medicine men, but maybe I'll give you some background on that another day. However, the main reason you hear a lot more about skinwalkers than anything else is because some of us don't have the same access to the internet as others in the rest do, simply because of the city internet companies. The companies tax the shit out of the internet, so it's not even worth it most of the time, unless you have a great income or quite a few people on the bill. But even if a native person does have internet, they most likely don't use the internet like everybody else does. They don't spend their time on Facebook, Reddit, or even YouTube. However, that's been my experience with family and friends. In our culture, when it comes to these paranormal stories, it's almost stories that have been told verbally, in person. So when someone in our tribe died, unless someone remembered their stories and passed them on, their stories died as well. Now, even if all the stars align, and a native does retell the story, and has access to the internet, has access to all of social media, most natives simply don't want to post their stories, cause even their own family and friends don't believe them, even if they have a few witnesses. You know, like most people wouldn't believe a half goat half man, or little people, water babies, all the different ceremonies and their uses. So instead of risking the quote unquote explanations and embarrassment, some of us just keep it on the inside until we meet another native that we can trust enough to not be judged and so we exchange stories without a worry cause you know they've seen similar things on their reservations hell I even heard people pleading that no one should tell anyone anything because you can tell the wrong person something and you might even bring a curse onto yourself or your own family hopefully now you know why there isn't that many stories you simply gotta become friends with a native well enough to hear a first-hand account of these paranormal stories. Why do you think the stories that you do find online usually begin with, I have a friend who is native who told me this, or my native friend wants me to post this on here. I do have a story to share, don't worry, it won't bring a curse on you, nor will it have a skinwalker knocking at your window tonight. But it's one that I share with everybody. So here it goes. This is about an old native ghost sighting. Back when I was young, I was getting ready for bed. When out of nowhere, my cousin shows up in a panic asking for my dad. He starts saying that he needs to be smudge. Being smudge is where we light some sweet grass, kind of sacred, and we pray while you pat the smoke all over your body. Anyways, we do this, and he starts telling us what happened. Remember, it's about 10 p.m. or later. I was already in bed ready to sleep when all of this went down, so of course it woke everyone up. He said he was driving down the road going home from a friend's house when he was about to drive past the massacre spot. Well, the massacre spot is a monument going around this corner not far from my house. At the monument, are eight or more graves along with a big stone shrine type of thing. And about 40 meters from there is another special cross where the priest was killed. I know the whole story but I'm just giving you a little bit of details. So yeah, a massacre happened. And it's a creepy old dirt road with nothing else. We drive by it daily depending on where you're going. The place is creepy to me and I try to stay away from it at night. Anyways, back to the story. He said he was driving past it when he started feeling nervous and scared. He said right as he was passing the monument, he looked over to his empty passenger seat, except this time, there was an old Native American sitting with him in full Native gear, not saying anything, just staring at him. My cousin is a huge wuss so he immediately pulled into our house. He didn't even look in his mirrors, he said he was too scared to look. 
Now, what makes me believe him is he straight out refused to drive home and asked to spend the night and sleep with someone in the house, which was me. As we were going to sleep, he even asked me to close my closet, which kind of scared me, and it also made me think that my great-grandpa was probably creeping on me through my closet. Now, when something happens to someone, you can feel and see the fear and panic in them. And that night, he was scared shitless, and it kind of scared me. But what really scared me and made me believe everything was that night as we were going to sleep, I could hear my dad in the living room talking with my mom. I don't know what they were talking about, but they stayed up pretty late singing songs. And the next morning, a medicine man came by and he started blessing our home. And he even told my cousin that he needed to get rid of the car. Yeah, I know this story wasn't about a skinwalker, but I'm sharing this with you to let you all know that there is another side of native culture within the paranormal side of things, aside from the Americanized skinwalker stories. And with this, I would advise you to never drive through the res at night. I remember the call as if it happened an hour ago. A child taken in the middle of the night. My partner and I happened to be in the area when the call came through. My partner sipped his coffee as I turned on the lights and drove over to the location. We arrived at the destination about 15 minutes later. I stepped out of the car into the frigid night air and looked at the house. Everything seemed quiet. Then the front door of the house burst open and a middle-aged woman ran out into the snow towards us. She was screaming for us to get her baby back. My partner sighed as I tried to calm the woman down. He wasn't doing that out of being bored, but more so annoyed. We have encountered missing persons cases before, and every single time, there was a mindless family member screaming in our faces. I know that dealing with a situation like this is extremely complicated. But when you become so worked up that you can't even think straight, well, that doesn't help anybody. After about 10 minutes of assurances, I was finally able to calm the woman down. I asked her if we could go inside the house to talk. She sniffled quietly and nodded. As the wind blowed against us, we stepped inside the house. And I asked the woman to sit before asking the general questions. Her name was Joyce Madison. She's a broker and a single mother of one. She called about her 10-year-old son, Peter Madison, a name that you should remember. She began explaining how this all started. I nodded to my partner to begin examining the house. Apparently, Peter had been having some issues over the last few months or so. She told me that one day, she was awoken to the screams of her son. Joyce jumped from her bed and ran to check on Peter. She found him sitting in his bed crying. When she asked him what was wrong, Peter told her he saw a face staring at him through the window. Of course, Joyce didn't believe it, but still, like a good mom, she examined the window, peering deep into the snowy night. After finding nothing out of the ordinary, she suggested to Peter that it might have been just a nightmare. This went on for three months. Every so often, at least once a week, Peter would claim he saw someone outside his window and would scream for his mom. She would wake up, check the surroundings, and find nothing there. She started to get worried about his mental health, and she eventually scheduled a therapist for Peter. During the last two weeks, Peter didn't seem to have any nightmares. According to his mom, she would wake up, make breakfast, and Peter would come downstairs. She would ask him how he slept, and he would simply reply with, Fine. Joyce assumed that all the therapy sessions were helping Peter. Well, that was until tonight. She was woken about an hour ago to the screams of her son. When she realized what was happening, she got out of bed, rubbed her eyes, and walked over to her son's room. She opened the door and found that her son's window was broken open and that her son wasn't in bed. I nodded as I jotted down the information in my notepad. And once again, 
I told her we were going to do everything in our power to find Peter. I joined my partner, who was already in Peter's room. Looking around, the window was forced open, like somebody had pushed it from the outside. The bed next to the window was a complete mess. I clicked on the flashlight and leaned my head out of the window. At the base of the window were a pair of large footprints, but they seemed off. They weren't tracks left by someone that was wearing shoes. They were large and pointed at the ends, possibly belonging to an animal, but that didn't make any sense. The tracks then led away from the window into the darkness of the woods near the house. My partner looked at me and shook his head. He didn't have to say anything. I knew the chances of finding the boy were growing slimmer by the second. Either way, we walked out of the house and followed the tracks to the edge of the woods. I called out to Peter, but there was no response. The footprints led into the brush, and we followed them. The woods surrounding the town were extremely dense. Even in the middle of winter, the trees seemed to grow right on top of one another. We tried our best to follow the tracks, but they were starting to change, as if whatever this thing was had increased its pace. We followed them for another 15 minutes before the track suddenly stopped. We called out to Peter once again, shining our flashlights all around us in the process. There was no sign of him, or whoever it was that had taken him. Over the following days, we got together a few search parties for Peter. We searched most of the forest, at least the sectors near Peter's house. We spent so much time out there, in fact, some of our team helping with the surge were starting to become ill. During those days, I paid a visit to Peter's therapist. It was a woman by the name of Dr. Betty Warner. She was shocked when I arrived. I inquired about Peter's sessions, and she was hesitating to tell me about them. However, after I told her that any information that she shares can actually help locate Peter, and so she became more understanding, she told me that Peter was hallucinating a monster, staring at him from outside his window at night. I let her know that I was fully aware that he was seeing something about once a week. Dr. Warner then shook her head and told me it wasn't once a week. It was every single night over the last few months. Every single night, something would be standing outside Peter's window and it would be watching him. I wasn't sure what to say, but she continued. She said that the reason Peter would scream on those nights was because whatever it was, was trying to open his window. On most nights, it would just stand there and watch him, not even moving an inch. He spoke fondly of those nights because after an hour or so, this thing would leave, and then he could actually get some sleep. The other nights, the ones where the thing would press against the window, causing it to creak and groan under the pressure, were the nights when he would scream for his mom. I asked Dr. Warner if Peter ever described what this thing looked like. She paused briefly and said he only described it once in all of the sessions that they had. He said it was tall, taller than his window. He said it had to bend down just to look inside. Its body was covered in long black fur. At first, he thought it might have been Bigfoot, but then he saw its face, bone, yellowish white. He said it would watch him without moving, but on some nights it would raise the large claw hand and press on the window. Even though I had a hard time believing Dr. Warner, I made notes and nodded politely. A costume, maybe. I asked why Peter had stopped screaming during the last two weeks. The doctor then thought for a moment and she assumed that he might have started realizing that it was all in his head. After two weeks of searching for Peter, we eventually called it off. There was no sign of the boy anywhere. This devastated Mrs. Madison. She got annoyed at the town and the police station for not being able to find the boy. A few days then passed since we called off the search. My partner and I were out doing our nightly patrol when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It looked like a bear walking on its hind legs in the dark, who was skirting along the nearby tree line. My partner was in mid-sentence when I slammed on the brakes. I turned on the searchlight. I quickly got out of my car and dashed over to the woods. 
My partner tried calling out to me, but his voice was fading in the distance. I ran through the woods with the twigs and snow crunching beneath my feet. It wasn't long until I found a set of similar tracks, like the ones from before. I pushed further into the brush. Then I stopped, not because the track stopped, but because I found what was leaving them. I stared at it as it lumbered away from me. I could hardly believe what I was looking at. I called out to it, demanding that it stop. And it did. And it slowly turned to face me. I looked up at it, and its face was exactly as described. Like the rotting carcass of an animal for a face. Upon seeing this, I drew my gun and aimed at this creature. It took a step towards me. The ground shook slightly underneath this thing's weight. A fire. The gunshots reverberated throughout the forest. It then raised its hand as if to shield itself from the bullets. When my gun ran out, it let out a scream but it also sounded like a roar. It took a step towards me and in one swift motion swung at me with its massive clawed hand. The impact sent me flying into a nearby tree. I awoke to my partner standing over me talking into his radio. I looked around and noticed that I was no longer in the woods. Apparently, he found me and dragged me out of there. He said he was calling me an ambulance and I told him not to worry about it. I was banged up for sure, but nothing to go to the hospital for. He asked me what happened in the woods after I ran in there. I just couldn't seem to find the words to answer him. I was just staring at the dark and lifeless trees in front of me. It's been about a week since that day, and three weeks since Peter has gone missing. My partner and I were once again driving around town, early in the morning, when we got a call about another missing child on the other side of town. My partner gave me an unsure glance, and for a brief moment, we both sat there, staring at the radio. I wanted to pick it up. I really did, but something inside of me was telling me that I got lucky last time and that I wouldn't get a second chance. As I started to move my hand over the radio, another car responded to the call. And I'm ashamed to admit to this day that as an officer, I was happy that it wasn't us. I have more questions than answers regarding the case of Peter Madison, like what this creature even was, or where it possibly came from or why it's only interested in children. But I know two things for sure. One, whatever it was, it definitely wasn't wearing a costume. And two, it took seven bullets at point blank range and it was still able to attack me. I'm not sure what happened to young Peter Madison, but to be honest, I'm not sure that I even wanna find out. I want to talk about something that I encounter at the forest. I'm not much of a storyteller, so don't get too excited. This isn't one of those fake stories. It's my own account of a failed hunting trip with my uncle. So it was December of 2014. I'm 18. I'm 250 pounds. I'm a power lifter. I'm heavy looking, but I'm not fat. My uncle had a kid a year ago. So he hasn't been working out in that time. He's still strong as fuck, but he's just got a gut from all the downtime. This guy is my hero. He knows so much about the woods that the gods must have showed him. Me and my uncle are staying with a family in a mountain home in Arkansas. I've never been hunting out here, so I'm pretty excited. There's supposed to be elk out here. We don't exactly have a tag, but the game wardens never come out this far. So you know, fuck it. We get up there at 3 o'clock in the morning to drive out as far as we can and then we walk about 15 miles into the mountains. We're so deep that the mountains block all cell phone signals. I got my SKS. My uncle then gets me situated in a deer stand cause he's already killed a deer this season and he wants me to get one. I end up so well situated that you would never know I was even there unless I pointed my phone's light at you. So we're sitting in this freezing temperature all day 
and we see nothing. Nothing but jack shit. My uncle told me to wait on him to come get me from my blind. It then starts to get dark, and I think, you should hurry up now. I mean, imagine being situated up in a deer stand, and there is nothing around you. No sounds. Nothing. And then it starts to get dark. Well, he finally gets there, and at this point I'm ready to leave. He looks at me, and sees that I have my finger on the trigger, because I guess I was scared. But he also looks a little bit worried. He says something was following him there from his climbing stand. As soon as he says this, this weird smell fills the air. It's almost like rotting meat, but with something else. He then said, let's go, we have like a three hour walk ahead of us. We start walking, and the whole time I'm thinking, why would you take so long to come get me, if you knew we were still gonna have to walk a few hours? I mean, basic rules of hunting, right? You don't leave when it's getting dark. You leave a few hours beforehand. Anyways, as we're walking that weird fucking smell is hitting us the entire time. At some point we're starting to get used to it. About an hour in, we hear this loud screech. That quickly makes us point our guns where it was coming from. Think about the sound of a small gorilla if it was shot about three times in the guts. That's the kind of sound we heard. And by this point, we've been walking a while, so we're pretty much used to the darkness, but we still can't really see anything. My uncle then says, Alright, you ready? We're gonna start jogging. After jogging for about 30 minutes, we hear this noise again. At this point I say screw it, I want to see what this thing is. I get out my pocket flashlight, I turn it on, and grab the front of my SKS with the same hand, and I point my gun along with the flashlight to the area that the noise came from. I'll be honest, I don't really like describing this thing, I don't even like remembering it. Even now as I'm writing this, I'm just thinking about it, just remembering it gives me chills. The image of this thing, this creature, has burned into my memory, and I'll never forget it. It was less than 15 yards away. It was a grizzly bear sized cat, standing on all fours, about 5 feet tall at the shoulders, with horns like a mountain ram or something like that. It had shaggy dark hair. It then made this noise again, and it started jumping at where me and my uncle were standing at. I remember as soon as I started doing that, it almost looked like it was twitching the whole time as well. As soon as it started, me and my uncle dumped every single mag we had. My uncle was racking the slide and firing as fast as he could. I don't know if we killed it, but we didn't fucking stick around. If we didn't kill it, then it shouldn't exist because we shot it so much. Me and my uncle started running all the way back to his truck, and we booked it out of those woods not looking back. I still have six deer tags to fill, and I don't know if I'll ever go hunting again. My uncle even sold his truck because of the memories that he gets from it. I mean he now drives a Chevy Sonic. I know right? But I'm thinking about getting some help. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. This year. So I had this friend who said that he would kill us if he ever ran into us again. He said he had killed some kind of creature, that there were two other creatures waiting to get him. I thought it was a complete joke. He said he didn't need to explain himself. And now, there is no communication with anybody in our group of friends. I'm the smartest one in our group and I'm able to have a general understanding of most things. He was saying some really silly stuff. He's the kind of guy who spent the last decade of his life trying to uncover the worst things out in the darkness. I mean, he ended up dropping his lifelong partners in crime. That's us, by the way. Saying that was the only way he could be happy. That he doesn't want to be caught again. He doesn't even acknowledge that we own a business together. The guy spent 10 years of his life in a place of desperation. Yet I could feel I knew exactly what he was doing. But that still didn't make him leaving out of nowhere. Less depressing. I wish I could have told him how sad and horrible it felt that he was leaving. I wish I was able to understand where he was coming from. Right before he left, he kind of started going crazy. 
we would be over at his house and all of a sudden he would start shooting guns out into the darkness at one point he ended up shooting his girlfriend's cat he was yelling about the creature that he killed he kept saying it was some kind of big monkey that had some evil eyes or something I don't exactly remember what it was but it was just bizarre sometimes we would be watching TV and suddenly the TV would turn off all on its own and he would scream at it and say I shouldn't be watching this much TV anyways he would sometimes go on rants about how the world has turned into a shitstorm and that he was trying to put out the fires and a bunch of other crazy shit like that I couldn't take him serious though he would go on about how everything seems to be going on in a slightly twisted direction but not in any way you could see I would sometimes try to change the conversation to get his mind off of whatever it was that was bothering him I considered getting help for him I told him he was being led to believe something like people on the internet do that he would be the weird person that was told to do something and he would end up dead because of it he was in a state of mind where he was oblivious to outside influence. People criticized him for making up things around these weird characters he had drawn. Now those drawings were disturbing. I always asked if I could see them and he would show them to me. But he would never let me hold the drawings. He would say that all of this stuff going on is being caused by evil forces. And everything that he was achieving was giving people nightmares. He said that he was going to write some kind of manifesto, but I was able to talk him out of it. He never finished it. Of course it said what he was doing. After reading it, I started to understand. He talked about having a younger brother, who they used to explore the woods together a lot. But then his younger brother was found dead. Apparently he was torn to shreds and mauled to death by something. They said it was a bear. But he thought very differently. I never even knew he had a brother. He never told me. We were friends just out of high school. So I never met his parents. But one time before he left. I talked to his mom who was visiting from out of town. She told me about the son they lost. And I told her how I thought that he was struggling mentally. And then his mom said that he never thought it was a bear. After his brother died. He spent almost all his time out in the forest. This whole time that I knew him, I always thought he was some sort of survivalist. Almost a doomsday prepper. But come to find out, he was looking for something. And to be honest, I think he found it. Or, it found him. I remember his drawings. They were of a killing in the forest by some kind of grotesque monster. This was surrounded by a bunch of people who were hugging the trees. I don't know if these were some sort of goat head blood drinking people that live in the forest or if it was supposed to symbolize something but people around us started getting mad at him because he blamed them for the death of his brother his whole talk about his brother and the forest and his drawings apparently everything stopped right before we became friends I realized that he likely has some kind of PTSD related to his brother's death I did confront him about it and he said that I have become too involved and that it was time for him to leave. He said he was leaving to protect his friends. And then he disappeared for three weeks. I think he went to try to find whatever it was that killed his brother. I'm not sure what happened. He was found near the side of the road, loaded with ammo, holding a rifle and bleeding out. He too had apparently been killed by a bear. After that, everything's been weird. His funeral is coming up. And lately, every time when I'm at home, I look out the window towards the forest. And I see branches move. And it just sends a chill down my spine. I know you might have some friends who tell you about some sort of monsters or things that they see. They might sound crazy. But you might want to start believing them. I always been curious as to why my uncle Jerry would always keep his light on in his own room while he slept. 
I remember as a young boy trying to pry the answer from him, but I was always met with the same answer. I just sleep better with a light, for some reason, he would say. Early this morning, however, when I was helping him move a new dresser in his room, the topic was somehow brought up. You really want to know why I sleep with the light on? His face turned serious, and he lowered his voice slightly. I mean, i only been asking you for 20 years, I said while laughing. But he didn't laugh. Instead, he gave me a look to shut up and listen. And this is what he told me. When I was a kid, around the age of 12, I never feared the dark. In fact, I enjoyed it. I found it peaceful and I would let my imagination wander and come up with all sorts of shit. Until one night, Grandma and Grandpa took your dad up to Baldwin to do some salmon fishing in Michigan. I didn't feel like going. I was going to have the house to myself and could do whatever I wanted. When they finally left, I remember being so excited. Up until this point, I had only stayed home one other time without them, but I had your dad with me. This time, however, I was going to be completely alone. After they left, I put on some music pretty loud since Pops didn't like loud music. He was getting old. I was having a blast, watching whatever I wanted on the TV without having to take turns and whatnot. It might have been around 1 in the morning when I started to get tired and headed up to bed. I got dressed in my PJs and turned the lights off while clicking my fan on. It was pretty warm for a fall night, I remember. After a short while, I dozed off, but something woke me up. It sounded like a weird humming noise. I sat up and looked around the room wondering where it was coming from. I didn't see anything though. It was too dark. The humming sounded like it was coming from the corner of my room by the door. At this point, I was starting to feel a little uneasy, but I wasn't too scared. After all, it could have been anything. After a few minutes it stopped and everything went quiet again. Then, the clicking noise started. It sounded like someone was snapping their fingers. Only fast and a little bit more quiet. What the fuck is that? I remember thinking. I still hadn't moved yet. I just sat up and listened. By now, my heart was racing pretty good and I was actually scared. I slowly rolled over and pulled the blankets up over my head. Jerry, I heard a soft whisper. As soon as I heard that, my heart almost pounded right through my chest. I could feel tears forming in my eyes. I was scared so bad. Everything went quiet again for a few seconds. That wasn't for long because soon after, I started to hear the floorboard start creaking. Whatever it was. It must have stood up because I could hear its bones crackling as it moved. The floorboard started creaking more as it made its way towards me. I squeezed my eyes shut as tight as I could, causing tears to run down my cheeks. Jerry, Jerry. it whispered again, only this time right at the foot of my bed. That's when I felt the bed start to sink in down by my feet as it sat on my bed. Even through all of this, I still hadn't moved other than to cover my head with the blankets. I prayed and thought that I was sleeping and would move on. The bed started to sink down closer and closer as it crawled further into bed with me. That's when I started to smell this nasty egg smell and it almost made me gag a few times. However, I held it in, scared that whatever this thing was would attack me if it hurt me. Jerry, Jerry, just, just look, look at, at me. me. It whispered again, except a bit louder. Jerry, look, look at me now. now. Its voice now a deep growl, filled with anger. I still didn't budge though, and I honestly think that this is what saved my life. The thing then started letting out this creepy laugh, as I felt the bed start to slowly release as this thing backed away. After a few seconds, it was out of the bed and I heard the creaking on the floor as it walked away. Even after I heard the door click shut, I still didn't move. I stayed laying with blankets over my head, all the way until morning before I finally peeked my head out. When I saw I was alone, 
I still didn't get out of bed. I just covered my head back up and went to sleep. When I woke up, I heard grandma and grandpa downstairs with your dad. And I felt so relieved I wasn't alone anymore. I never did tell them about what happened that night. Nor did I tell your dad. I just kept my lights on ever since. Your grandparents stopped trying to get me to turn them off after a week or two. After I kept throwing massive fits every time they tried. So that's it. That's why I keep my lights on. And for some reason, I feel safer in the light. Like it won't come for me unless I'm in the darkness. You should keep your lights on too. Trust me. You don't want to go through what I did. You don't want to hear somebody whispering your name in a demonic voice in the middle of the night. It was the single most terrifying thing I ever been through. I live deep in the mountains and my hollow is surrounded by woods. There is a little spot you can walk to in the woods which is just a giant circle with trees open all around it. Me and my friend went to have a picnic there that day and we started to hear what sounded like a flute. It was really loud coming from the direction where no house is there. Mind you, all my neighbors were old and I can guarantee you that none of them spent their time walking deep in the woods to play the flute. We heard this for hours and we left about 8 o'clock that night and when we started walking back you could hear it somewhat across the valley. I didn't hear it again for a good two years after. However, one night I woke up at 3 a.m. and my bed was right next to the window and I had it cracked to let some fresh air in while I was sleeping. I woke up to the sound coming right outside my window. And I was scared to look out to see what it was. It went on for about an hour before it stopped playing and I never did hear it again. I did talk to a few friends about this and one of them said to not worry about anything. It's most likely a native spirit that has enjoyed the positive energy me and my friends brought to the forest and it decided to check in on me down the road. Now that I think about it, it didn't feel evil. The only time it did worry me was waking up to it outside my window. I also done some research and apparently if there's water nearby, you'll also hear drums. Other beliefs like if you hear it during the night, it's a bad omen. But if you hear it during the day, it should be something good. However, there's also been stories about people gone missing in the woods after hearing flute-like sounds. Or that there's something that wants you to go look and follow it. And it might not be good. Especially at 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm sure there's some truth to these beliefs. And the true meaning behind it has been twisted and distorted by now. As it's been passed on through different people. If anybody knows a medicine man. Or a true native person. Would you mind asking them for me and letting me know? Living in a small town has its advantages. For example, you get to know everyone who lives there pretty quickly. If you ever have a problem, chances are that there's someone in town with the expertise to help you. Like Jimmy, our local handyman, electrician, and plumber. If you have a household problem, Jimmy's your guy. If you got a more difficult problem, then you probably want Mac. He's our town sheriff, the only law enforcement we have for a few miles. Are you feeling hungry? Then Sherry's the gal for you. She runs a diner in the center of town, and her pie is out of this world. What I'm trying to say is that it pays to know people. Another thing I find fantastic about living in a small town is the sheer amount of nature that surrounds us, untouched by man. The trees seem to grow endlessly into the sky. The nearby creek is crystal clear. Not like those contaminated ones I hear about in the city, but I think the best part about living so far away from the city is the peace and quiet. It's intoxicating. Occasionally, sometimes, you'll hear the rumbling of a semi-truck passing by, but that's about it. You could step outside your door at any given time 
and be greeted with pure silence. I have always found the silence peaceful, like our town was secretly tucked away from the rest of the world. Even though I do enjoy the peace and quiet, that's not always the case for a lot of people. I work in the only gas station for miles, and we often get a lot of people stopping by there to refuel before heading back onto the road. Even though most of the people tend to fill up at the pump and continue their journey, sometimes I'll still get people to come inside, and they'll mention how unnaturally quiet it is in this town. Since I only lived in this town my entire life, I never noticed how different it is from the rest of the world, but I'll just take their word for it. It just makes me uneasy, is what one of the customers said to me when I inquired. They said they couldn't put their finger on it. Just something about the silence of our town made them uncomfortable. Well, this town makes me uncomfortable too, but it's not the silence that drives my fear. It's something that happened to me when I was a kid. My friend Tommy and I were always together as children. We would do everything together, explore the forest, fish in the creek, play in one of the many meadows that littered our town until the moon signaled our curfew. It was early October when it happened. We were playing together as usual, riding bikes up and down the town, until he got the bright idea to pay a visit to the Blackbriar Farm. Now, this farm has a bit of history, but I'll try to sum it up. Basically, the Blackbriars were the first to settle in this town. They were a working class family and their main export was corn. They had cornfields as far as the eye could see. The town itself was in the early stages of forming next to the farm. Then one day, in the middle of October, the entire Blackbriar family disappeared. Nobody knew why. Some people said that the head of the household, Michael Blackbriar, took sick and passed away. And at that point, the farm was too much to maintain without him so his family left the farm for greener fields. Others think a pack of wolves or some other animal got to the family and tore them apart, and they were never seen again. Regardless of what happened, the farm was abandoned and had been left untouched for decades. For some reason, our town either didn't have the will or the means to tear the farm down and start something new, so the old farmhouse was just left, standing there. Even though the house remained empty, the cornfield seemed to continue to grow year after year. They would produce and even our local market owner would pick fresh corn from the field and use it. There's no point in letting it go to waste, they would say. Then the field would wither and die, only to regrow all over again the following year. So Tommy wanted to go exploring in the field. He had this absurd notion that the Blackbriars had a stash of treasure somewhere on the farm itself. After all, they were a supplier of produce for a while, and the town didn't have a bank during those times, so they had to do something with all that money. Well, the sun was quickly setting as we approached the edge of the farm. Reluctantly, I followed Tommy into the looming forest of dried corn husk. Our footsteps crunched beneath us as we marched further inward. It was deafening how loud our footsteps were in comparison to the rest of our surroundings. As we pressed on, we began to hear a new sound. It was faint over the crunch of our footfalls at first, but as we walked closer, the sound grew louder. It was crying. Someone was sitting in the cornfield, softly crying to themselves. Unsure of the situation, I asked Tommy if we could head back, but he shook his head, mentioning that someone might need our help. We found ourselves in a small clearing in the field. On the other side from where we enter, we saw it, or I should say, her. It was a woman. She was sitting on the cold ground. She was wearing a silky white dress, which had been stained by the dirt she rested on. Long brownish black hair covered her face and shoulders. She sat facing away from us, and the sobs that she was doing seemed to reverberate off the surrounding stalks of corn. Tommy, fearlessly, approached her and asked her if she was alright. When he did, her sobs instantly stopped, and the overwhelming silence returned. She rose to her feet, 
still facing away from us. I took a step backward while Tommy took a step ahead. Then she turned. But how she did it triggered alarms off in my head. One second, she was facing away and in the blink of an eye, she was turned towards us as if she were a glitch in a video game. She raised her head and her hair parted from her face, revealing a gory facade. Its flesh clung to her skull-like tape. Half of her jawbone was exposed. Her eyes were gray and lifeless. Dirt seemed to pepper the remaining parts of her skin, which combined to form a sickly brownish color. Tommy and I both screamed. I immediately turned to run away, but then I heard Tommy call out to me. My body reacted on its own, and I turned back. Tommy had been grabbed. Her hand gripped his wrist so tight that even from where I was standing, I could hear the bones in Tommy's wrist begin to splinter. Her mouth began to open and separate, as if she were some sort of snake-like creature. She pulled him closer and raised him up. Tommy struggled to turn his head away from the creature to look at me and managed to say one thing to me, the last thing I would ever hear from my best friend. Run! And I did. I ran through the cornfield as fast as I could. Tears streamed down my face like a waterfall as I realized I left my best friend behind to die. I made it to my bike and pedaled as fast as I could to the police station. I told Mac everything that happened. He quickly gathered up a search party and it was almost every single person in town. After going through the cornfield for hours, they found no trace of the woman. And the only thing they found of Tommy's was a shoe. Weeks turned into months, which turned into years. Eventually, everyone in the town started to forget. It was just another tragic missing child's case to everyone, aside from Tommy's parents and myself, that is. New children began telling stories about the cornfield, how anyone who goes in is never heard from again. Those stories aren't entirely accurate because I was there with Tommy that day and I made it out, alive. Not a single day goes by that I don't regret what I did. And not a single night goes by that I don't have to drink myself into a drunken slumber. Ever since I started working at this gas station, I saved up enough money to move away from this town for good. To start a new life somewhere, far away. Away from the cornfield, and away from the tragic memory of my dear friend. I plan on leaving at the end of October, but two nights ago, after I was closing up the gas station, I heard it, the silence broken, by some faint sobs coming from the other side of the road. My body ceased as I saw her, standing there on the other side of the road. I wanted to believe that I was just seeing things, but I knew better than that. She was facing away from me, and without even giving her a second to turn around, I ran to my car, got inside and drove away. I'm at home right now, and I wanted to type this up before I leave this place for good. Just so whoever hears this knows how sorry I am for Tommy and to stay away from the Blackbriar farm. I'm not really sure where I'm gonna go, but I need to hurry. I left my window open, and I think I just heard some crying coming from outside. So if I don't make it, Remember, if you hear a woman softly crying to herself, just stay away and call the police. Or, you might end up just like my best friend, Tommy. I lived alone in this house for the past year, and up until now, I haven't had any issues. I had first moved into the small town in the middle of the Midwest a year ago after my job had to relocate me. I'm a factory manager and I oversee the daily operations of a newly built factory on the outskirts of town. The moving parts suck, but once I was finally moved in, I would take a moment to view my surroundings and I was fascinated. I was never much of a nature guy, I spent most of my youth in a major city. But seeing all the towering trees that wrapped around the entire town, like a protection barrier that made me feel safe, 
The intimidating mountains that form the backdrop of our town were also very impressive. They gave the horizon character. It was truly a sight to behold. After around 10 months of living here, my company was opening up a new plan and they asked if I could go oversee operations once again. However, this time, I declined. I asked if I could stay as the permanent manager of this location. They did mention a slight pay difference, but I didn't mind. Over the past year, everything was perfect. I would wake up at around 6 a.m., do my daily morning ritual, stop by the local cafe, which gave the best coffee on the planet, and be at work by 8. My job at the factory was quite simple. I was basically a babysitter. I dealt with discrepancies, did paperwork, checked in with my supervisors, and finally headed home around 6 p.m. My job probably sounds very tedious and boring to a lot of you, but I still enjoyed it. Plus, even with a pay cut, I was still making a pretty decent salary. I'm sure most of you aren't here to listen to me talk about my job or this town. However, at the beginning of last month, I saw something out in my backyard. The way my house is set up, my backyard butts right up to the surrounding tree line that surrounds this town. I had just gotten home from my job and was lying in bed, watching TV until around 10 p.m. When I finally got ready to go to sleep, I turned off the TV and also my nightstand lamp. I had rolled over and was facing my bedroom window, which pointed directly out into my backyard. It had snowed a few days prior, so my entire backyard had a thin layer of untouched snow. I was staring out the window, letting my mind wander as I was beginning to drift off to a peaceful slumber, when I saw the flash of something near the tree line. Seeing whatever it was, made my mind refocus itself as I started to scan the trees outside. Not even five minutes later, I saw them. Two eyes were shining in the tree line, reflecting light from some unknown source. They would bob up and down for a moment before stopping and staring at my house. They would then turn to the right or left, disappear for a minute or two then reappear at a different spot. At first, I thought it must have been a wolf or maybe some other nocturnal creature looking for food. I put it out of my thoughts and fell asleep. For the entire week straight, those eyes had basically become a routine for me as they started to appear every night in the same exact spot. I would lie awake and watch them intently. I thought that maybe perhaps the area and the trees was some sort of natural grazing spot that whatever animal this was had become accustomed to eating here every night. I watched as the eyes walked left to right, disappeared, and reappeared until my tired eyes could no longer stay open. At the end of the first week, something happened. I had just finished turning off the TV and had rolled over to wait for the animal to arrive. A half hour passed, and I was just about to go to sleep when the eyes reappeared. The eyes shined brightly in between the dark trees. After a few moments, the eyes seemed to get closer to my house. They were faintly growing in the distance. Then, once it crossed into the threshold into my backyard, my motion sensor lights I had set up on the back of my house went off. My eyes shot wide open and I felt my heart rate slowly start to increase. As I saw what was standing in my backyard, it looked like a man, well, almost a man, who was hunched over on all fours like a dog. Its skin was bluish gray and stringy black hair clung to its scalp like the legs of a spider. Its eyes were massive, taking up most of its face. The sudden bright light caused it to raise a hand to shield its eyes. Its fingers were disturbingly long, like bony sticks, hovering over its face. The thing fell back and scrambled into the dark trees. 
after watching this event unfold. There was no way I was going to go back to bed after that. I got up from my bed and looked around my backyard. A few moments later, the motion sensor lights diminished. I continued scanning the trees for any sign of this creature, but it was gone. I spent the rest of the night trying to find any information I could on what I had seen. I looked around at countless websites, putting the description of what I saw. Most of them spoke of a ghost and demons, but this didn't seem like a demon to me. It looked like a very real thing in my backyard. There's even other websites that mention various creatures that had some similar traits and features as what I saw in my backyard. The following week I watched every window every single night in case it came back. But every single night, I was met with nothing. I was starting to think that what I saw wasn't even real. That I had fallen asleep while watching the trees. And that my own mind had crafted this vivid nightmare. At the beginning of last week, however, I realized it wasn't a nightmare. It was very real. I was heading to bed a little bit later than I normally would. And as I lay there, I began watching through my window. I wasn't watching as intently as I was from the previous week. Then, after one long blink, it appeared. And this time, I felt my heart thumping in my chest so hard that I thought it was going to stop at any moment. I could feel the air beginning to steam my eyes as I hadn't shut them for two minutes straight. The reason I was so unnerved was that the creature was lowering its head from directly above the outside of my window. The roof of my house was still a fair distance from the top of my window. So that meant that this creature was somehow clinging to the outside of my house like a spider on a web. It stared into my window at me. Our eyes were locking in place like if we had some staring contest. I was wondering why my motion sensor lights hadn't gone off at all, but that thought quickly left my mind as I saw the creature reach its hand towards the glass. It began raking its sharp, jag fingernails along the glass over and over again. The sound that was produced from digging its fingers into the glass, it's embarrassing to admit, but I was scared at this point, too scared to think and too scared to move. It pulled its hand away from the window, and with a quick swing, it shattered the glass into pieces. When it did this, I fell back out of bed and onto the floor. I wanted to get up to run out of there, screaming my head off, but I couldn't seem to take my eyes off this creature. It slithered its way through the broken window and crawled along the inside of my wall. It then stopped once it reached the corner of my bedroom and just stared at me. Its mouth began to crack open as if it hadn't opened its mouth for some time. Broken, sharp rotted teeth filled its mouth as it seemed to smile at me. A slight feeling of disgust began to form within the overwhelming fear that gripped me. In one rapid movement, the creature lunged from the wall of my bedroom over to me. It grabbed at me with its long fingers while its mouth was snapping in my face. I could truly sense that this creature was trying to kill me, or possibly even eat me. The commotion caused the lamp on my nightstand to topple over. I managed to switch it on with one hand, while my other hand held the creature at bay. The sudden light seemed to blind the creature briefly, and in that moment, I brought the lamp crashing down onto its head as hard as I could. It slumped over onto its side, and I shoved it off of me. I quickly got up, left the room, and called the police. I explained that a wild animal or something had broken into my house. They arrived shortly after, and I led them through my house into my bedroom. But when I opened my bedroom door, the creature was gone. They examined my broken window and realized that I was actually telling the truth. Even though when they asked me to describe what kind of animal it was, I stopped myself from telling them that it was a monster. 
I told them that I was sleeping and that it was too dark for me to see what it was. They nodded and told me to call them if it ever comes back. That was the beginning of last week and I have since repaired my window and made sure that my motion sensor lights are working. I'm not sure what that creature actually was. Maybe some of you out there have more experience with this and can let me know. But as for me, well, I think I'm going to actually contact the higher ups in my company and I'm going to ask them if that new manager position is still available. If it is, then I'll be more than happy to leave this place. When I was a kid, my favorite time of the year had to be winter. There was just something about all the festivities that gave me a sense of wonder. It might sound a little cliche, or possibly a little cringy, but to me as a kid, the holidays felt magical. I would spend my winters watching my family put up all sorts of decorations around the house. Lights, ribbons, and I can't forget about the star attraction, the Christmas tree. My father and I had this tradition. Every year, we would venture out to our local tree farm, and he would let me run around and select our very own Christmas tree. It was one of the few times that my father and I had a chance to bond. He would tell me all these stories about his past, and how his own father would take him. Even though my father wasn't one to show emotion, I could tell that these trips to the Christmas tree forest actually meant the world to him. As the years progressed, my love for Christmas kind of diminished. I suppose that's something that just happens over the years. People get old, develop a new interest and responsibilities. During high school, I honestly couldn't care less about Christmas. To me, it was starting to just become another day, another pointless get together with people whom I barely even know or remember. Maybe it was those rebel teenage years, but I just couldn't see the point anymore. That must have been the reason my parents stopped putting so much effort as they used to. Eventually, my father stopped offering to go Christmas tree shopping with me, and the holiday just sort of fell by the wayside. During my senior year in high school is when I met Sarah. She was incredible, and we instantly clicked a few months after meeting. We began dating. Early into our relationship, I realized fairly quickly that her family took Christmas very serious. Every year I was amazed by all the decorations and how much they loved Christmas. It was honestly like something out of a Christmas movie. As time went by, Sarah and I moved in together. We had lived in different apartments over the years until finally we had saved up enough money to buy a house in the suburbs. As the year started drawing to a close, and the winter holidays were fast approaching, I wanted to try and rekindle my old love for Christmas. Once December came around, we went out, and I bought a ton of decorations. We filled up the house from wall to wall, with many different items. Decorations in every size hung in all the windows, and also on the doors. The lights had been strung up around the exterior of the house. It was most likely a bit too much, but I still had fun putting all the decorations up. Sarah and I had talked about what we were going to do about the Christmas tree. She offered to go buy a synthetic one at a store somewhere, but I told her I had a better idea. I explained to her about a weekend that my father used to take me tree shopping, and I told her how it used to be my favorite part of Christmas. Without missing a beat, she asked me when I wanted to go. We made plans to go shopping for one at the end of the week. And I'll be honest, that made me feel happiness I hadn't felt in years. Friday had arrived, and after getting home from work, Sarah asked me if I still wanted to go. I nodded, and with a smile, she grabbed her coat. We headed back out into the winter air and hopped into my truck. We drove four hours trying to find a decent tree farm. A few of them had already sold out, which was quite shocking to me. And other tree farms, well, their selection didn't look too great. 
After driving for nearly 45 minutes, we found a place. As we pulled into the lodge, the tires of my truck struggled to get any traction in the snow. Our shoes were crunching into the fallen snow, and we walked up to the gate. The trees that stood before us seemed to stretch in every direction. Sitting off to the side was an older man, who seemed to be reading a book by a portable heater. Sarah and I walked over to him, and he struggled to peel his eyes away from his book. In an effort to be funny, I asked him if he had any treats for sale. But the look that he gave me over the edge of his book didn't seem to be amused. With a heavy sigh, he rested his book into his lap and pointed out to the trees. Then he said, Find one you like and come let me know and then I'll get it for you. I said thank you and entered through the gate with Sarah following closely behind me. As we entered the forest, we both stared in wonder at all the options. Sarah quickly called me over and asked if this tree would be good. The tree was kind of tall to fit into our house. It was a great tree, but it was too big for a living room. We continued walking, looking around for that perfect tree. After a while, I realized I could no longer see the light from the entrance. The shift in the air was chill, and the warm glow of the light bulbs had been replaced by the cold moonlight overhead. Sarah rubbed her arms in an effort to stay warm, and I was beginning to realize that we needed to decide on a tree pretty quickly before one of us freezes out here. Then, we saw it. The perfect tree, only a few yards ahead of us. I grinned as we got closer, but as I was getting closer and closer, I heard Sarah whisper for me to stop. My feet stopped in place, and I turned back to look at her to see what was wrong. Sarah was staring off into the distance her face more pale than I had ever seen before. I asked her what was wrong, but she didn't answer. She just kept staring. I followed her gaze and saw what she was looking at. Between a few trees off in the distance, two eyes were looking right back at us. The shadows cast by the trees around it were obscuring its body, but its eyes seemed to pierce through the darkness. I looked back to Sarah and she managed to whisper, saying that we should leave. I turned back to look at the eyes in the darkness. They were still there, still wide, and still staring directly at us. Then, the eyes began to move out from the trees. As they did, they started to rise higher and higher above the ground. After a few seconds, the eyes were nearly half as tall as the tree it stood next to. It stepped out into the moonlight, and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Its body was unlike anything I had ever seen before. It looked like some kind of beast. Dark fur covered it from its head to its toes. Massive clawed hands gripped the tree next to it, and I could see the tree strain from the pressure. Large horns were protruding out from its head crawling up and back from its body. It exhaled a deep breath through its nostrils. The gust of warm air visibly obscured its face for a moment. It took another step closer. The twigs beneath its feet were crunching loud as it approached. I could see its face a little bit better now. A dark liquid dripped from its lower jaw, staining the pure white snow beneath it. Sarah took a step back and I could hear a twig snap below her foot. I turned my attention to her and she was nearly crying at this point. The twig snapping was like a trigger. The creature started to roar and this drew my attention back. That's when it started to run at us. But it wasn't running like a fucking animal. It was running like a person. And looking at this, my eyes went wide with panic. And I turned to Sarah yelling at her to run. We both began sprinting through the snow, dodging the numerous trees as they passed us by. Even though we were both running as hard as we could, I could still hear that thing's footfalls growing closer and closer to us. Then, the sound of splintering wood echoed from behind us. I turned just in time to see a massive tree falling towards us with immense speed. 
I called out to Sarah to look out, and she moved away from it. When I did the same thing as well, the tree impacted the ground, and it shook the earth beneath my feet. I called for Sarah, asking if she was all right, and for a moment, there was no answer. I called again, and that's when a response came. I ran around the fallen tree, and I found her sitting near another tree. I held out my hand and helped her up. That's when we heard another loud shriek coming from deep in the woods. We looked to one another before running out of the forest back into the light of the entrance. The old man looked up from his book and asked us if we found one we liked. But we paid him little mind as we ran out of the fence, hopped into my truck, and drove away. There's quite a bit of few different things in this world that I can't explain. And that night is at the very top of this list. I have no idea what that thing was. Maybe some of you out here have an idea, but I'm at a complete loss. I still love the holidays and Christmas, but this year, I think I'm just gonna buy an artificial Christmas tree. And I would advise all of you to do the same. Stay away from the forest and be careful when you go in there if you go in there to look for a Christmas tree. My girlfriend talks in her sleep. She's been saying the most horrible things recently. I'm infatuated with her and it wasn't at a healthy level, far from it. I would think about her every moment she was away. I would sometimes sit on my couch and just stare at my phone waiting for her to text. I'll tell myself, don't contact her, don't. It will come off as too strong. But then I would still find myself clicking her name on my contact list before my inner voice would continue. You don't want her to know how desperate you are for her. It's unattractive. It will scare her off. No, you must wait for her to call you this time. But it was tiring and exhausting, almost unbearable. I once heard that the ancient Greeks believed that falling madly and irrationally in love with somebody was a curse that you would wish upon your enemies. I could never understand what they meant. After all, isn't falling head over heels in love the ultimate goal nowadays? But now that it's happened to me, I have to say, the ancient Greeks were right. This is a curse. I was barely in control of myself, almost as though my infatuation with her had possessed me. The two of us were sexually active together, but still in the dating phase. We were at that make or break era of a blossoming relationship where we would either have the quote unquote talk and formally be in a relationship or we would start to slowly drift apart. The latter of which I don't think I would be able to cope with. Honestly, I wouldn't be able to. Almost everything about her captivated me. The way she held her hand over her mouth when she laughed. How she caressed the pendant of her necklace when she was scared. How she would twirl her hair in her finger when she was excited. All of it. Her smell. Her smile. Her eyes. Yeah, I know. It probably makes you sick reading about it. I feel the same way. I was never the hopeless romantic type. But now, I can't stop fantasizing about her. I would think about us doing the long three hour hike up to that magnificent view from one of our first dates to that first kiss as we overlooked the lights of the city. But this time, I would get down on one knee, bring out the ring, and, well, you know what would happen next. Alright, fine, I'll stop. Yeah, this is a girl only been casually dating for a couple of months. I shouldn't even be thinking about proposing yet. I know that. I'm just barely able to control myself any longer. I feel as though I'm losing power over any decisions that I make. 
And that brings me to why I'm here writing this out at the moment. It started with the first real thing that troubled me about her. We had never actually spent a night together, no matter how late she was over. Once either of us showed signs of being tired, she would up and leave. She wouldn't leave awkwardly or in anger, just a casual kiss goodnight, a smile, and a call me soon. It was something I didn't really even notice the first few times she did it. But after almost eight weeks of dating, it was becoming strange. I have to ask her about it. It took drinking almost an entire bottle of wine before I had the courage to do it. She looked almost defeated when I asked and lowered her eyes in embarrassment. I knew this talk would come eventually, she started. She took in a deep breath with a long drawn out exhale. Recently, she paused again. I started talking in my sleep. She shook her head in embarrassment. It's called some niloquy. I looked it up. I shrugged and laughed out loud. My demeanor seemed to say, that's it. No, Stephen, listen, she said. She wasn't laughing. It's bad. It's, it's completely out of control. It's not just random words or gibberish. No, it's horrible. I say horrible, disgusting things. She was starting to raise her voice and started tearing up. I approached her and held her. I told her it couldn't be that bad. I told her to spend the night. I said she was most likely exaggerating, but I was wrong. That night she stayed at my house, but she warned me of something before falling asleep. Whatever you do, don't wake me up. It makes me really scared and confused if that happens. And don't respond to me, just ignore it. I nodded and agreed. And if it becomes too much, she continued, just leave the room and sleep on the couch. I won't mind. I told her not to worry about it. I told her it wouldn't be a big deal. I told her I wouldn't leave to the couch, that I would stay beside her in bed. But I was wrong. I couldn't even last one night. We both fell asleep without incident. I'm not sure how many hours passed. But I woke up in the dark with the sensation that someone was watching me. And then I remember. She was with me. She was actually spending the night. I smiled. But then I noticed the shadow outline of her sitting up on the bed. She was looking down at me. Staring. It creeped me out. I'll admit it. Her posture was entirely different. It was as though it wasn't even her at all. Then... She spoke. It wasn't her voice that I heard. It was much lower. Like something out of a scary movie. I'll chew the skin from your bones. She said. I froze. At first, I just kept looking at her. This was not at all what I expected. I thought it would be more like just random swearing and shouting. I honestly thought to myself, what am I going to do if she attacks me right now? What if she really does try to chew the skin from my bones? But then, she just lied down and went back to sleep. I was creeped out. I tried to lie back down and ignore her, but I struggled. I couldn't even close my eyes without thinking. Maybe she's sitting up again and staring at me. And then one time I rolled over to look at her. And she was. Her face was pressed right towards mine. Her breath was foul and rotted, something that was not normal for her. She spoke again, in the same voice as before. If you don't move to the couch, you'll be dead by morning. That did it for me. I sat up in a moment and headed for the living room. She made some sort of wheezing sound as I left. I think it was supposed to be her laughing. I was lying on the couch, but I wasn't going to be able to fall back to sleep. I was far too shaken. I was staring out towards the window, hoping to see the first few hints of the sun rising. I thought I heard something from the bedroom. I listened, and then I heard it again. Steven. Steven. It was that same low voice. 
Steven. I tried to just ignore it at first, but then it continued. Steven. 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 Still, I said nothing. I know you can hear me, Steven. You're awake now. Why don't you come back into the bedroom? The voice barely sounded human. Or maybe you'll prefer if I come to you. I still didn't say anything. I was told not to, but I listened. If I heard her start walking towards the bedroom door, I'm not even joking. I would have run right out of the apartment. But she asked me not to respond to her sleep talking. So I didn't. And then she spoke once more. Sorry if this spoils your plans. She began laughing. The two of you were supposed to walk that trail again. She started. I wasn't even ready for what she would say next. You would both be so tired when you'll reach the top. You'll look over the city. Then you'll get on one knee and bring out the ring. She began laughing. And that's when I realized that this wasn't just a problem with sleep talking. It was something much more. Something supernatural. I had never told anybody about my proposal. There was simply no way she could have known about any of it. This was no longer about merely talking in one sleep. This was about possession. I can't go back into the bedroom. I have no idea what would happen if I did. Instead... I'm gonna wait it out, holding up in my living room until the sun rises. I have a couple more hours yet. I can hear her laughing occasionally in the bedroom. And it's still not her voice. It's still that same low pitched cackle. But as I sit on my couch writing this out, here's what scares me the most. Maybe my infatuation and obsession with her wasn't normal. I said before that I felt like I was losing control of myself. More so I believed in the typical falling in love story. I feared that the infatuation I felt was this thing slowly taking control of me. Of it controlling my thoughts, fears, ambitions, and anxiety. Maybe once I become completely absorbed, a transfer would occur and she would be free of it. I know I should leave, that I should open the front door, get in my car, and drive away from here, but I can't leave her. I already lost control. I'm infatuated with her. My friends and I were out camping in Maryland near a river. We set up a whole weekend where we could go tubing, which meant that we were going to get in these giant inflatable tires and float down the river. We got there on Friday, go tubing on Saturday, and leave on Sunday. It was me, my girlfriend, her best friend, and her boyfriend. The four of us were supposed to have a great weekend together that instead turned into a nightmare that will keep me away from the outdoors for good. I'm pretty sure I had an encounter with the goat man. We arrived on Friday. We set up our tents at the designated campground and made dinner. There were no other campers around us since school had started up again. So we had the area to ourselves. We drank all night. The other three drinking more than me because I'm not a fan of the hard stuff. Just a few beers. It was around midnight when I had to go pee, so I left the campsite and walked down the path a little bit into the woods. When I found a good spot, I unzipped my pants and began to relieve myself. When I looked ahead, and faintly, in the moonlight, I saw something moving in between the trees. The moon was about half full, so there wasn't much light to make out the features. The leaves and sticks crunched underneath it. Just as I was finishing up, This thing started to make this weird noise. It sounded like a muffled goat sound, but not quite right. Like a person was imitating a goat. It kept walking around like it was looking for something. But whatever it was, was scaring me. 
So I ran back to the campsite and acted like it didn't happen. My friends were so drunk I don't know how they would have reacted. The next morning, I woke up before everyone else so I made breakfast. At around noon, we drove up the river about 3 miles using the camp's van service that would drop us off and we would tube down the river back to our campsite. I had pretty much forgotten about the weird encounter from the previous night until I had a weird feeling of somebody watching us as we were floating down the river. It was nothing but woods on both sides of the river, so I couldn't really confirm my feelings. But it ruined the whole experience while going down the river. It creeped the hell out of me. My friends started to feel it too when I told them. The other boyfriend claims he saw someone on the river bank, but no one else saw it. Once we got back to camp, I told him what I saw Friday night, and it really creeped him out. That's when the boyfriend said the thing he saw kind of looked like a weird shaped man from a distance. We were all scared and decided that we would leave first thing in the morning. After a while we began drinking again and pretty much forgot about our fears and for a moment had fun again. It wasn't until later that night that my fear returned. We were all pretty drunk at this point and then we started to hear those noises again. It started off in the distance at first then got closer and closer to our campsite. We started to hear noises all around us like twigs breaking, scratching on trees, and more of those goat noises mixed with a man growling. None of us had a weapon so we were all pretty scared and we all huddled close to each other. The scariest part was that the bugs stopped making noises. Eventually, we all drank some more and fell asleep around the campfire. I woke up in the middle of the night, most likely because I sensed something was wrong. I'm not sure how to explain it but it was like sleep paralysis or something where I couldn't move and couldn't speak. I opened my eyes and I saw this terrifying thing in between all of us. It had the body of a skinny man with a distorted face and long unnatural arms. I saw that it was pacing back and forth between us. It would stop and look at my girlfriend and then it would arch its back and act like it was chuckling it kept twitching its body and sniffing the air around everyone. This thing finally came over to me and looked me in the eyes. It had these dark pitted eyes and its mouth was wet. It got close to me and opened its mouth making that noise into my face. The noise must have woken the boyfriend and he started to scream which scared the creature and it ran off on all fours back into the woods. I was finally able to move and I crawled over to my girlfriend and held her the rest of the night. First thing in the morning we packed our stuff and checked out at the main lodge. We will never go back to those woods in Maryland again. There is something living out there and I'm telling you the story because I don't want anything to happen to you. Hey everyone. I could really use some help here as I'm starting to get really worried. Last night, I was followed by a very creepy lady when I was out hiking in my local trails at state land. I have hiked and hunted these trails my whole life, and not once have I encountered anything like this. Don't get me wrong, I had my fair share of scary things happen to me when I gone solo camping. But this, this has scared me right to the bone, and now I think I'm being followed. Let me explain what's been going on, and hopefully one of you may be able to help me out here. Last night, Christmas Eve, I had nothing to do as I have no kids, no wife, and my parents live three hours away. So to kill some time and not be bored, I had the idea of going on a solo hike through our local trails. Like I said, I have hiked these trails many times. This time, however, I'll never forget. I got out to the trailhead about 5 p.m. I had my headlamp on and I knew these trails like the back of my hand so I wasn't too concerned with the sunlight quickly fading. I don't know if any of you are from Michigan but we're having a surprisingly sunny and warm December. However, it still gets dark here around 5.30. The weather was beautiful and perfect for a nighttime walk. We don't have too many nice winter days like this. So I wanted to take full advantage and enjoy warm night air. 
So I got out of my truck and started up the trailhead. This specific trail I was on started out in dense pine trees. And after a mile or so, it opened up to these awesome valleys with huge fields. Most of the time, if I was quiet enough and looked around, I could see some deer grazing and other wildlife. This time though, there was nothing. I was quite surprised there wasn't a single animal, considering how beautiful of a night it was. Now that I think about it, I didn't see or hear even a squirrel in the pines, which is very uncommon. There are many in these parts, and no matter the time, I can always hear them running and playing in the trees. This time, it was dead quiet. I kept on walking though, and just enjoy the peace and quiet. Once I exited the pines and entered the first field, I started to get this nagging feeling in the pit of my stomach, like something was watching me. I chalked it up to me being paranoid because of the lack of wildlife, and continued on. I wish I would have turned back right then and there, but if I did, I wouldn't be here telling you the story, would I? Anyways, I continued on and the feeling just intensified as I progressed. At this point, I was a good mile and a half in, and it dawned on me if there was something out here with me, I was screwed. Not a single person knew that I was out here. I never had cell phone reception in this area. If some kind of animal was stalking me, I would just be done for. I was kicking myself in the ass for not bringing my handgun with me honestly. We don't have a whole lot of dangerous game here in central Michigan, so I didn't think twice about it when leaving. I was nearing the end of the first field, and before I stepped into the next little section of pines, I decided to take a quick look around, just to satisfy that nagging feeling in the back of my mind. At first, I didn't see anything, but just as I was about to turn back around, something caught my attention. There was slight movement back about a hundred yards behind me. What the heck? I whisper as I squinted to get a better look. I wasn't sure, but it looked like a figure, half hidden behind a bush. I stared closely, and when I saw it shift slightly, my heart leaped into my throat. The figure was definitely humanoid, and it appeared to be staring right at me. Hey, I foolishly called out, hoping whoever it was would simply identify itself. As soon as I said that, the figure quickly ducked behind the bush, disappearing from my view. My heart was racing pretty good at this point, a million worst case scenarios running through my mind. I couldn't help but think it was a serial killer, ready to pounce and stab me to death, stashing my body in these woods. I turned around and started walking a little faster, trying to distance myself from whoever was out here with me. To my horror, I heard twigs and sticks snapping a little ways behind me as the person started to follow me. I have a gun, I shouted, trying to scare them into leaving me alone. I looked back over my shoulder to see where they were at, and when I did, my heart started hammering in my chest. I swear I thought I was going to pass out. The person was now maybe 20 feet behind me, and I could tell it was a woman, except that her jaw was hung open, as if in complete shock. Her eyes opened extremely wide, staring directly at me. When I first turned around, she was still walking and the way she moved scared me so bad it sent me into a dead sprint upon looking at her. I know it sounds kind of funny, but believe me, it wasn't. She was tiptoeing as quiet as she could, in the same way a cartoon character would try to be sneaky. Her legs taking these huge, lanky steps. Everything about the way she looked and moved just sent these shivers down my spine. Leave me alone, I shouted as I ran away as fast as I could. That's when I started to hear her laughing as she chased me. She was no longer trying to be quiet as I could hear her crashing through the woods, catching up to me rather quickly. I decided to turn and run off the trail once I rounded a bend, where I knew she couldn't see me for a moment. As soon as I stepped off, I quickly hid behind a tree and turned off my headlamp. After a couple of seconds, I heard the sound of her heavy, odd footsteps as she got closer and closer. I held my breath and slammed my eyes shut, sending a quick prayer to the Lord above to just let her pass. Her horrible laughing sounds echoed through the woods as she thankfully ran past me. As soon as her footsteps sounded a little further down, 
I jumped out from behind the tree and took off running back the way I came. I hadn't even gotten 20 feet when I heard a blood curling scream coming from behind me in the woods. I ran faster than I ever had in my life, running on pure adrenaline and the will to live. I just knew if she caught me I wouldn't make it and it would be a horrible, painful way to die. The sound of her footsteps once again got louder and louder as she got closer. How the hell was she running so fast? I felt a huge wave of relief as I saw the entrance to the trail, maybe a hundred feet ahead. Somehow, I ran even faster as I knew my truck would be right there. I digged into my pockets and fished my keys out. She let out another hideous scream as she got even closer, maybe 50 feet behind me now. I got into my truck and jumped in, putting my keys in the ignition and starting it in record time. I backed out and peeled out of there as fast as I could without losing control. After one final scream of frustration, I looked in my rearview mirror to watch the woods disappear. The whole drive home I kept checking behind me, afraid I would see her chasing after me, even though I knew it would be impossible at 60 miles per hour. Five minutes later, I pulled into my driveway and jumped out of the truck once parked, running full blast inside. I slammed the door behind me and locked it. I ran all around my house locking every window and door, not feeling safer until I knew I was locked up and safe. I walked upstairs to my bedroom and laid in bed. After a little while I must have passed out from being exhausted. I awoke to the pitch black room and quiet house. My heart started racing as I remembered the lady from the forest and I jumped up to look out my window. No, I whispered as I looked in my backyard. The lady from the woods was standing in my backyard, slack jawed and staring right up at me. My heart once again pounded so hard I thought I would faint. As soon as she noticed me, she smiled this huge, impossible, wide ear to ear grin. She then shrieked that awful scream again and ran back into the woods. Needless to say, I didn't sleep after that. And that's why I'm here. If anyone has an idea of what the hell this lady is, as I know there's no way she's human, can someone please let me know? Maybe give me some advice on what to do here. Thanks in advance. I myself am not Navajo, but my friend is. He grew up around Gallup, New Mexico. He loves to tell me stories about skinwalkers. He knows it gives me the chills. According to him, they are not like werewolves, but are dark spirits that use the skins or even the flesh of anything living that may serve its purpose. They will also use animal parts as totems. For example, they will take the claws from a bear or the antlers from a deer. They are known to come after humans too, but he says that's a native thing and that white people have nothing to worry about. He says the only way to make it stop bothering you is to take away its disguise. The scariest story he tells is about this Navajo trucker that his father knows. Every night he makes the long run to the reservation from Gallup. One night, when halfway there, he hears a loud noise against the front passenger side of his truck, thinking he might have hit something. He pulls off to the shoulder of the road to take a look, but he finds nothing, not even a mark or dent on the fender. So he gets back on the road and resumes driving. But only a few seconds later, he sees something in his rear view mirror towards the middle of the road and moving up on him. And it's not another vehicle. Then, just as suddenly as it appears, it's gone. Shrugging it off, he goes back to paying attention to the road, with his semi going about 60 miles per hour. He chances to look in his mirror, and again, he sees this thing chasing him, and it is moving fast. Just like that, it's at his driver's door, and holding onto the handle and striding along. Then without warning, it turns to him with his dog-like face and dull, dark eyes and smashes in the window. 
The driver slams on the brakes. The cab of the truck goes into a slide. The trailer jackknifing past him. The whole time, this creature is holding on to the door and reaching in through the broken window trying to grab him. Somehow, the truck comes to a stop blocking both lanes of the road straight across. The driver is so scared, he doesn't even notice the creature is gone and instead throws the door open and runs off into the desert. Now, he must have passed out or something because he awakes with the sun coming up and finds himself huddled by this rock formation. He's dusty, a little dirty, and missing his shirt, but is otherwise unharmed. Sitting there getting his bearings, the events of the previous night come back to him. He gets up to his feet, dusts himself off, and walks out back to the highway, not knowing what to expect with his truck. However, as he reaches the road, he sees it park as neat as it can be there on the shoulder. When he gets up to it, he sees there's nothing wrong with the driver's door window. It's as if he imagined the whole thing. He does notice, however, a series of small scratches on the driver's door all around the handle, as if something was clawing at it. These marks were not there previously. I grew up in the woods. I was raised by a single foster parent, Margie, and she was too busy to bother with me. So instead of hanging with my foster siblings, I went into the woods. By the time I could drive, I was spending more time in the woods than I was at home. In all seriousness, I don't think I slept at home one night my senior year. There was something about being in the forest that made me feel at peace. Something that kept Margie's shit parenting at bay. Over those years, I learned nearly everything about the forest that a kid my age could. Foxes sound like people. Cougars are perfect hunters. Bears can climb trees. And the most important thing, if the forest goes silent, something is wrong. If you're going to take anything away from the story, I pray that you make it that. Silence is not good when you're deep in the forest. Like anyone in my situation would, I moved away from home as soon as I could. I packed up my room, loaded up my truck, and found a nice outdoors town by a state over. I was beyond excited when I saw an ad in the newspaper about some trapping gear that someone wanted to sell. Trapping and hunting were some of the better jobs I could work as they paid well, and being born native meant that I could apply for a year-round hunting permit. Plus, it would give me an excuse to live up in the woods and only leave every once in a while with that idea in mind. I called the owner of the gear, his name was Clark, and asked what he was selling and what it might cost. He told me that the set contained eight different traps, an animal call box, snares, knives, and a Winchester 1200. He was selling everything for 2500. I had saved up money that I had made or that was gifted to me, and being young and dumb, I bought everything. Within a week of buying the gear, I bought my permit, and the state I'm in requires a separate trapping license, so I got that one too. All that set me back another 400, but I was finally ready to live like I wanted to. Clark said that there was a hunting lodge I could stay at. No one owned it, so it was free to stay. People would repair it when it needed to be fixed, and that was about it. From that point on, I became a woodsman, and I lived like that for a few years, spending more time in the woods than in my own apartment. Trapping had actually made me a good amount of money, and when furs and pelts weren't doing too well, the meat and the claws sold well too. I had become accustomed to the noises from the woods, animal calls, God-awful noises, wind blowing through the top layers of the trees, all those sounds became ingrained in me. So now, I guess I'll tell you all why I'm actually writing this. Last weekend, I went out to the lodge to settle in. There was no one at the lodge when I got there, which is pretty normal for midsummer. I'm the only native that hunts up here, so I'm the only one that stays here all year. 
Aside from a single backpack on one of the beds, the lodge was barren. I set my gear down, grabbed a can of soup, and headed to the kitchen to make myself something to eat. As I walked past one of the windows, I saw something along the edge of the trees. The lodge was in the middle of a circular break in the forest, so the area around the lodge was just open. No canopy, no trees, just grass and ferns. On the edge of the tree line was something. It was a little too dark under the shade of the trees to really make out what it was, but something was definitely there. I tried to study the figure, looking for a shape or some color, but it was too hidden and I came up empty. Eventually, the figure faded out of sight, walking into the deeper part of the woods. As the sun started to go down, the watercolor sky changed from a light blue to a deep purple before fading out into blackness. I took out some of the snares, grabbed my shotgun, and walked out of the lodge. I like to set the snares at night, that way the animals trip them when they wake up to look for food. It just makes more sense. Clicking on the barrel mounted flashlight, I stepped outside. Something instantly felt wrong, almost like if I was somewhere new. I had walked the woods at night hundreds of times, but they felt unfamiliar now. The wind blew far above the treetops adding an almost musical sound to the surrounding area. After I got a few snares set up, I decided that I would finish the others once the sun came up, and I started walking back to the trail leading to the lodge. On the way, just before I broke the tree line next to the trail, I saw someone walking on the path just out of the reach of my flashlight. He didn't seem to have any gear, and he must have been walking by the light of the moon as I didn't see the beam from a flashlight. Feeling like a bit of a trickster, I clicked my light on and made my way silently back onto the trail. My plan was to sneak up on the guy and scare him. Seeing as he didn't have a gun, I figured I wouldn't get my head blown off. He was pretty far ahead of me, so I tried to walk a little bit faster, but he made it over one of the hills on the trail and left my line of sight. Expecting him to pop back up on the other side any second, I hustled a little bit to close the gap. When I got closer to the hill, a shriek ripped through the nearby woods. I heard every animal in those woods make every noise they could, and I still have no idea what could have let that scream out. It sounded like the call of some ancient, terrible beast. A creature that was far more intelligent than anything else in the woods. I switched my light back on and called out for the man I saw earlier, but he was nowhere to be found. Part of me was hoping he took off running towards the lodge, but every ounce of me knew that I couldn't wait around to check. So I bolted back up the trail, and that's when the horrible noise came tearing through the woods again. That's when it hit me. Apart from the noises and my footfalls, the forest was silent. No birds. No small animals, even all the wind had gone away. There was absolutely no noise. My boots stamped against the dirt, kicking up dust and rocks as I tore up the path trying to run. I've been hunted by cougars, bears, wolves, but this time, something felt different. I still felt like something was watching me, burning its eyes in me as I ran. Only instead of it watching out of a territorial need or a need for food, was actually playing with me. Like it was allowing me to keep going. Like it was waiting for me to catch some air. By the time the lodge came into view, another noise, another shriek. This time, it sounded much closer. I pushed the door open and when I spun around to slam the door shut, I saw the same man from earlier. He seemed very calm, and he stopped just as he broke through the tree line. Nothing about him seemed normal. How did he end up behind me? I had been looking ahead the whole time, and I never passed him. Apparently, he was right on my heels too. At least if he was that close when I got to the cabin, but I didn't hear him behind me. When he started to walk, I slammed the door shut and locked it. Whatever he was... 
he wasn't getting in here. Using my flashlight, I went around and turned all the lights in the lodge on, and then checked all the windows and entrances. Once the place was secured, I sat down on the bed and tried to sleep it off, thinking that the sun would force whatever I heard to retreat. Within seconds of snoozing, I was woken up by the sound of banging on a window. The grogginess of my sleep was wearing off as I neared the source of the banging. From afar, I could make out a vague, white shape in the window. The longer I stared, the more clear it became. It was the exact same guy from earlier, face pressed against the glass with his hand banging on the window. Hoping that I could just walk up and ask what he wanted, I started to walk ahead, slowly. When I got within an arm's length of the window, the man stopped slamming his hand into the window, and instead, his jaw dropped. At first it stayed at a normal distance, but after a while, his jaw began to crack, and it descended even further down. His mouth was hanging open, and I noticed the sound, quiet at first, coming from his throat. It was a low, deep groan. After a few seconds of groaning, a voice came from him. Open window. That's all he said. Nothing more. Nothing less. He was just repeating that line over and over. Open window. Open window. Open window. No emotion. I told him to fuck off. That I wasn't going to die because he wanted to come in. When he didn't back off. I turned and grabbed my shotgun, walked back up, and placed the barrel against the window. Open window. Open window. He began to shake like he was having a violent seizure, twitching, maybe from the cold, maybe from something else. That's when the same piercing shriek from earlier came out of the dark hole that was his throat, and he slipped away in the darkness, leaving the window. I was able to get a little bit of sleep that night, but I was briefly awoken a few times by more noises and more shrieks. When the sun had started to creep up through the sky the next morning, I checked all the windows and then deemed it safe enough to go outside. Circling the lodge, I noticed a few things. Footprints leading from the same window that this man or thing was at back to the forest. And on the other side of the same window were deep scratches. Other than that, the surrounding area was normal. Nothing out of the ordinary. I was feeling safe enough to be able to walk down to the trail and to my truck. So I grabbed my gear and noticed that the same backpack was still there. It had been there since I got to the lodge. And I figured that someone might have left it up there and forgot about it. I figured I would grab it and leave an ad in the paper about it. I loaded up the backpack and left the lodge, not even bothering to check on the snares. The trail seemed longer than it had ever been before, and the hiking down felt uneasy. But it wasn't until I got within sight of my truck that I really lost it. Just as I came to the part where the trail opens up, I decided to take one last look into the woods and behind a fallen tree, I saw him, the same man from earlier, standing there, watching me. I tossed my gear in the back, jumped in the truck and drove off. As I sped down the road back to town, I noticed something in the woods alongside the car, just ahead of me. Looking outwards towards the road was the same man, but something about him looked different. His arms seemed to hang down to his knees, and his face looked more sunken. Fearing that he would find a way into the car, I floored the gas and hoped there wouldn't be any state troopers out. I got back to town and headed home. I needed to rest, and a few days later, I decided to head to City Hall and turn in the backpack and warn someone about what I had seen. Before I even got to the permit section of the building, I was stopped by the lady at the front desk. She asked me if I'd been out by the lodge, and I told her yes. She asked me to wait in the lobby, 
and I agreed. After a few minutes, the sheriff showed up and asked to talk with me. Apparently a day or two before I went into the woods, there had been an animal attack. A hiking group of three people. One died, one was missing, and the one that made it back, really bad. The sheriff wanted to know if I saw any strange animal activities, and I told him what happened. Instead of disbelief and a laugh, he asked me to take a look at a picture and see if I recognized it. When he took the picture out of his pocket, I almost had a panic attack. It was the same man I had seen in the forest. It looked like a driver's license photo or something. The sheriff wasn't surprised when I told him that was the same man. He actually thanked me and left the building. I wanted to just forget about everything, like it never happened, to go on with my life and keep living how I'm used to. But there's one issue. Sometimes, when I look out my window at night, I swear, I see the same man. But now, his arms are far longer than any human arm. And his jaw still hangs loose and open. I think it followed me from the trail. And I'm not sure what to do. I never told this story to anyone. And I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today, and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house, but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced-in area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high, and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced in area and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in, to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. 
noises like people working at night or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree but the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it the dog also creeped me out but you know angry dog and I was a kid it happens now I do get scared pretty fast I always been that way for example I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone my friends however tend to be more outgoing just the kinds of people I get along with this time I had a friend over his name was Jacob we were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis we started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game it was around 2 a.m. that's when we heard it we turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play there was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in like somebody was rolling something really heavy around we hadn't heard it before because the noise from what we were playing was loud I immediately got goosebumps Jacob was not really worried about it but it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there it was just a forest for miles and it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit dragging and rolling something really heavy eventually Jacob convinced me to just play some more games I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides. I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway, right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room but I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear, but he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out, but it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him. But when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes. So I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer and... That's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in I checked on my mom who was fast asleep then I turned to go into the bathroom it was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad when I reached for the door and tried to open it though it was locked that's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door um in here I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. 
I stared at the doorway, unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it, and Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep, then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything, so after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him, because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settle down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence, so the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself. It keeps going like that for a long time though. Suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering. We hear the dog run away. There's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new. A small stretching sound on the back wall of the room. We both try to be silent as we can. Eventually, it stops. After five or so minutes of silence, Jacob decides to be brave. He decides that he's going to wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on. I wish he wouldn't leave me alone, but there's absolutely no way I'm going to go out there. He arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us. Then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out. I close it as quick as I can behind him. In less than 30 seconds, I hear a scream. Not long after, the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost. He looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon. His eyes look as big as dinner plates. I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly, her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock, and as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door, and by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer, because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall, in my mother's low voice, 
the same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by, go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away. But that one night still haunts me. I still refuse to go out at night unless I'm with a bunch of people and I will never ever live in the woods again. Anyways, I hope you all enjoy hearing about this as I probably won't tell the story again. Thanks for listening.